who is not long time ago. And the audience was of approximately 2,000 cardiologists and internists. And we asked a simple question. For evaluation and management of risk factors, the scientific community and some of the guidelines refer to high, intermediate, or low risk scores. How many of you have these scores, score tables, or charts in your offices? The answer were astonishing and reassured me of my personal position. Of these 2,000 cardiologists and internists, only 11 raised their hands. So, so to have an impact on primary prevention, we should thus begin by simplifying our approach to the evaluation and management of risk factors. And we also discussed it yesterday, where we can, we can have very complicated guidelines and very accurate guidelines, but they will have no impact if they are not used and if people find them complicated and don't use them. So the word he used here in this editorial was, it should be simplistic, simplified, it should be simple. So primary prevention strategies for individual patients should be simple and personal. And I think we should think about that when we prepare the new guidelines. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> the IMT is uh, accepted in Germany. Is it accepted in Denmark, in Norway, or any other? So it, is it, no one measures IMT in Denmark. No one measures coronary classification in Denmark. Very few measure ABI, the vascular surgeon do, and Henrik Sillesen do, but he has had a hard time to get other cardiovascular surgeons to also measure ABI. So we, we don't, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are working hard on it, but the, it is the traditional way the Danish Heart Foundation recommend that you should know your cholesterol level and your blood pressure. That's it. That's it. Now, you heard in the U.S. the barriers that we discussed and, and adopting the guideline uh, and, and the legal issues that the doctors would be afraid of getting sued. How is it in Europe? And maybe, uh, Brandon, you can come here. Uh, is it just an ESC guideline and then boom, everybody's going to follow? Or everybody has their own European uh, style and, and they're not going to really, I mean, there's so many countries here, it's yeah. not the United States. No, that's all. Uh, and, um, at the time, it's changing. I just had to uh, uh, be in a lawsuit where um, a patient who suffered from a heart infarction accused his doctor that he was not uh, informed about his risk of myocardial infarction. Uh, he went to the doctor for some, well, flus and whatsoever. Uh, and uh, during these visits, uh, the doctor never uh, informed him about uh, the risk of myocardial infarction. And uh, we have uh, distributed and quite available um, information about primary prevention, similar to what other countries do, uh, concerning uh, aspirin, concerning the pentadol and so on. on. Yeah, I was asked to, to write a review to it and uh, stated that uh, primary prevention is something which of course has to be done. And when a, pa a patient sees a doctor and the doctor is just neglecting, uh, despite that he knows it, uh, that somebody is at risk, uh, I think uh, he's not doing a good job. So the European countries, like in UK, there's a top-down approach, you know, NHS approves and then a lot of uh, doctors follow. What do we need in Europe in order to turn the corner to practice? Do we need just ESC guideline, or we need to go to every country and talk to every primary minister of health? Uh, yeah, there's several different ways. I think one way is to go with the Europe Convention, because they have a huge influence. There are widespread connections to many disciplines, the European Society of Hypertension and the Pathology other process and so on. So that is. Uh, Ta a task force which is uh, important for us. Uh, the ESC is important uh, and uh, of course the ACC is trying to get a lot of relation to the ESC. 
and disease committees. We have really to work to bring the topic of prevention and the, the role of uh, imaging techniques and non-imaging techniques to improve the risk assessment forward. Okay. Let's but hear. But definitely, uh, uh, Europe is not easy. As I told you, New Germany has not accepted this prevention uh, carta, which the EU prevention has uh, uh, presented. But oh, so that prevention charter. charter. Yeah, prevention charter, which uh, Lars Heiden and others uh, have written. It, what, uh, so it, it is diff difficult later on then in different countries because they have different money, you know, the problem increase, you know, the social systems in different areas. Um, so um, it will not be easy. We have always to go to all different countries, to the different national structures. Okay. Erbil, are, are, you, are you aware of the NICE guidelines in uh, Britain? Uh, they recent, rec recently, uh, they, they have written the guidelines. I don't know that they're funded yet, NICE. And in those guidelines, the low they go with pretest likelihood of coronary artery disease. Unfortunately, they're only talking about symptomatic patients, but it's still relevant. In the low intermediate likelihood of coronary artery disease group, the NICE guidelines recommend coronary calcium scanning. If the coronary calcium scanning exceeds, I think it's 400, exceeds a certain number, uh, 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 then they are, then they recommend the next test be a coronary CT angiogram. Uh, so, uh, in asymptomatic, in asymptomatic. No, in sim low in symptomatic patients with a low risk, risk low pretest likelihood of coronary disease. Oh, okay. so, so, so this is just yeah. recent that the CT has become more central in the NICE guidelines, yes. and the starting point is not the angiogram, yeah. the way it might be in the yes. states. The starting point is the coronary calcium skin. Yes. What country yeah. is that? It's uh, Great Britain. Yeah. It's yeah. Primarily UK, but they have like 30 organizations that sign on to those guidelines usually. I mean, it's usually a comprehensive group. Yeah, it's, a, it's the National Health Service guide. Let's hear the other side of Europe. Uh, it's also a neighbor, Sweden. Well, <coughs> we're neighbors with Germany. I, I don't really agree. I, I think it's a mixed pattern. Uh, ESC has a lot to do, and they are working hard for the moment, I think. But of course, it's, Europe is, is a very mixed map of economies and, so, and, and legislation and all that. Uh, but there are also uh, the Europe Prevent strategies and, and Europe Prevent meetings. And uh, they are working hard with the annual meetings. And then it's national initiatives, like the Norwegian uh, initiative, the UK initiative, and, and the Swedish as well. Sweden and Norway are really working hand in hand. Yeah. So in the cardiology guidelines, uh, we have a priority of 350 different treatments, and, and primary prevention is there as well from 2008. And everything concerning traditional risk factors has a ranking between 1 and 10, not to do, and, and for research only. And right now, it's a separate big document from the National Health Agency concerning prevention. But it's not about CIMT or, or calcium, it's the traditional risk factors and family history to map it in individuals in the healthcare centers. I, I just want to add something about the barriers, because I think uh, it's not just ignorance from the general practitioners to take well, really work with it. It's, it's more of professional pride, I think. It should be the holistic ones. They should be the ones who decide about it. And, and to override that, uh, it's very important with good opinion leaders from the medical community. Uh, good doctors, so to say. And the other way is to have, on the local or regional level, um, agreements between internal medicine, cardiologists, and general practitioners how to deal with these problems. Uh, and at least in Sweden, it, it works quite well. So we know who should do what. And if we don't do it, we are not doing a, a good job. Uh, and uh, 
The third point I think is very important that primary prevention, at least in Sweden, is to a great deal a matter for the dedicated and trained nurse and technician. It's not the, the, the time consuming and expensive job for doctors. They are the consultants in primary prevention work. I think that's important. If we think that we will be coming with progress in primary prevention and base it on doctor's job and time and cost, I think it would be hard to be successful. We have to have organizations within the clinics, in the healthcare centers, well-trained, dedicated nurses and technicians, really with a focused work, work with primary prevention. And the doctor is more, more like a consultant. That, that's a way to overcome barriers. Uh, in addition, I think that uh, it's an education, it's a medical school, and the young doctors and they have to come into their thinking. Uh, I want to uh, stress one additional point where I think it could be better uh, be easily than say, well, we want to prevent events and so on. And there is an uh, introduction of written. Uh, my greatest stimulation uh, in the work is uh, to prevent sudden death. And um, uh, we have to take my, I think, in the introduction and the presumption of the, of the document uh, strong arguments so that the people understand why it is so important. When you just say we want to prevent myocardial infarction, well, that's nice. Um, but we have to take the number, which I think most important is 60% of those who die from myocardial infarction die outside the hospital. And these numbers uh, is, is something which really should alert the people. Yeah. The, and this number has, in Germany, where we have the data, not changed during the last 10-15 uh, years. It is uh, reassessed once again. And when you look to it, the town Essen, we know it very well because we have the first widespread myocardial infarction program so that everyone with ST segmented infarction, so we still <coughs> is treated the same way. It is, he is registered and we know the numbers. And for, we have 400, about 400 and 600,000 people. But there are 1,200 sudden unexplained deaths where the emergency car just goes away as it went today. So what I think the point here is in, in US, as we discussed, there are so many things and it's mostly you know, state by state and city by city and, and you have to be very active in educating local. There is national guidelines, but practitioners don't have the time. We're trying to draw a conclusion in Europe. Uh, so what Europe looks like, it's more difficult to even predict how it goes because you sit in each country like UK, there's top down, then then Denmark, if you succeed, then suddenly it changes everything and everybody will adopt it. But uh, in Sweden, it, it's not like this. So even if you go and get an ESC recommendation, that's not going to result into a massive adoption. Is that is that a correct conclusion? So when we have to go in each country, try to create local awareness and go through each country's Ministry of Health and their own network. Uh, would there be any issue in terms of uh, reimbursement and, and incentive for doctor's office? Would doctors in, in Sweden or, or uh, Scandinavian or other, or even Germany, uh, be more motivated if they see it, um, you know, current calcium or cryo device that they can make money? Is that at all the possibility that they will be that money is driving. Ma, 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 but money is not driving in the UK because they, they're not getting more or less if they do or don't because it's, it's just NHS. It's the same thing, it's, it's, it's not money. It's not money. So in, it's not money driven. Maybe yeah. it's the reason that that's one of the yes, that's one of the yeah, that's one of the problems because if it's not if they do or don't, they don't get any you know, changing their bottom line. So is it the same in, in Sweden? Yeah. In, in the whole Scandinavia, it's not a reimbursement system system like you have. So if you have a good argument to do it, 
to have this system will do it. But in, in Sweden at least, it will be a little bit um, decided from the ranking I told you about. So if, if uh, like smoke, stop smoking, that's rank, it has ranked number one. But I, I would think that uh, calcium scoring would have a, a rank eight, ten, or not to do with RISA, I don't know. We haven't done it yet. So the ranking will have a, a strong influence of what we do in the clinic or in the healthcare center. Okay, so it has to go come to the national guideline of each country. And from there, the education that drives it. There is no incentive reimbursement in barrier to adoption with regard to economical aspects. So the focus is in lifestyle. Yes. It's a ranking. It, it, it is how to live healthy, exercise, don't smoke, don't get obese, and all that. It's a ranking. And what we're talking about here, using more accurate tools to find the find the people, technology, preventive the treatment. It's not much interest, not much focus on it. No, but API, for instance, it's it's in the prevention uh, list with ranking, and, and and more of it will come now. The coming years. So ABI is recommended in Sweden. Yeah, we more. It, it's spreading fast at the moment. Okay, that's good news. All right, Jim. I think what we're seeing is, in general, um, there is an interest by many of these countries in sort of public health guidelines, but not individual risk assessment. So when when. Uh, when Erling mentioned make it simple and personal, <coughs> this idea of personalized individual medicine is not something that takes hold in countries that are looking at their resources. And so the simplistic things that are important, which is to avoid smoking, often take precedence. Uh, we see this even in discussions when Matt was in a uh, debate with uh, Rita Redberg, and the issue of why did President Obama have an EBCT Carney scan. Uh, her response, and in her editorial uh, in the archives, is, I would have just told him to stop smoking, as if that's really an answer to risk assessment. All of us would have said, stop smoking, and we think that would have a substantial effect on longevity. Nobody, thought, told, told, nobody thought to tell him to stop smoking. That's Rita's idea only. She's right. the first person to talk about smoking. But I mean, she, she acted like that was a substitute for risk assessment, in the same sort of way in which countries look at, if you can just give something like advice on exercise and other things, that's enough. Um, I think there's also an attitude. Uh, um, and I would have mentioned this as an obstacle. The attitude among doctors has to be that a heart attack, and this is uh, Forrester's comment from Cedars, uh, a heart attack should be recognized as a failure of prevention, not the beginning of prevention. So many practices, you get a heart attack and you survive it, now you're a graduate of a failed prevention program, let's start prevention. That's secondary prevention. We have to start thinking of a heart attack is a failure of identification and a failure of prevention. And that's not personalized to most practices. Uh, they don't look at it that way. They look at it as in inevitable, fatalistic, that a certain percentage of my patients, since it's the number one killer, will get heart disease, and then I'll respond. Great. Well, I think uh, we've, we've touched on every problem and bear in one thing that we probably can uh, learn from is how the system, symptomatic part of coronary artery disease being managed in recently, like this at STEMI centers that have become so universally uh, uh, adopted and they're practicing the same way. Well, that's the symptomatic part. We perhaps should try to duplicate that for asymptomatic and shift the cardiology. This shift may take 50 years to happen. It's not an easy job. This, Eight, the symptomatic uh, management or, or universal management of symptomatic coronary disease took 30, 40 years, and that's an emergency, that's a heart attack. Uh, you know, we're just there. So asymptomatic to become adopted, uh, uh, treated the same way, universally practiced the same way, it definitely requires a huge industry motivation and incentive. If there is no industry behind this, who is going to care for it? The doctors are not going to be able to go out and create centers. So those are 
real issues in practical matters. I'd like to move us move on to actual training. So if you if you uh, are going to be reimbursed, what do you need to uh, uh, have in place? And uh, as you know, in the state of Texas, we uh, moved on with an initiative that was um, frankly brought to us. We weren't the first to lobby. I was contacted by a congressman in uh, Austin who uh, went to get uh, a coronary, uh, a CT scan, and uh, his insurance uh, denied re uh, reimbursing him. And he ended up having a bypass and was very upset and uh, so pursued this uh, uh, legislative uh, 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 initiative. They contacted me, they said they found online um, thanks to Dan Keeney, they uh, felt that we were very close to what he was going to do. So uh, we went through so many meetings and back and forth, educated him what is the value of uh, uh, coronary calcium and carotid IMT and shake. And it ended up uh, uh, one time uh, uh, in 2007 uh, going through the insurance commissioner, uh, insurance committee, and then. Um, the House of Representatives, but I couldn't go through the Senate. And in 2009, as uh, most of you know, we were uh, happy to see the bill reintroduced and we testified it again and uh, it was passed as HB 1290, the first legislative initiative to become law uh, for prevention of uh, preventive screening of cardiovascular disease, and this is quite shocking. Now, looking back, what we've accomplished, and that is the bill recommends uh, uh, screening, pretty much inspired by Shay uh, people. With, uh, but we, we did try to be more uh, politically accepted by incorporating the intermediate framing and risk group, uh, but pays up to two hundred dollars for coronary artery calcification test uh, as well as carotid IMT. However, and that's where I'm going with this is, however, the caveat is that we didn't have any uh, standard certification program. We said by uh, nationally accredited and professionally recognized uh, laboratories. And that, at that time, we thought it was great you know, the fact that we're getting a bill to do this. Now here, a year later, I'm, um, uh, um, you know, afraid to, to say that, but we really didn't succeed as much as we thought we would because the barriers to actually becoming uh, certified was not easy. First of all, in, in uh, Texas, there are not many CT or coronary calcium centers. I think uh, years ago, when Jim uh, Ehrlich and others had these centers, diagnostic centers, there were some, and along with others, they went down, and most uh, uh, hospitals have a C, uh, the, the uh, new CT, uh, uh, multi-detector CT, but they're not active in coronary calcium. Uh, the carotid IMT is even worse because they, uh, the bill recommends uh, they would be either ICABEL, International uh, uh, Accreditation uh, for Vascular Laboratory certified, or by any other uh, uh, the standards that approved by CMS. And so at that time, we talked to ICABEL committee uh, members and we told them that we would like them to be the reference for this bill. And they were very positive and very open. Unfortunately, after we got them into the bill and their name was uh, passed, they did not really come forward as well as they had uh, initiated. So uh, we, they were supposed to come up with a guideline and recommendation and we made it very clear that we want you to realize the purpose of this bill, the purpose of this bill of law is to enable primary care physician offices to be able to adopt this screening and get reimbursed and have motivation to manage those patients. Not tertiary hospitals like Texas Heart Institute or St. Louis uh, or Methodist major 
hospitals to do that. So we, we, we and, and those are uh, reported in the insurance committee's uh, uh, minutes, but we ended up three months later telling they, they, the ICAO team telling us that they cannot come up with anything, they need to, to go through the board again, and then that took another four months all the way to the end of February, uh, which was nine months after passing the law, uh, they came up with uh, a not pleasant uh, report that's, that made the long list, and I'm gonna show you through this, but I can't go through all details, but basically it makes it almost impossible for a primary care physician office to become ICAPL certified, and it only will be vascular laboratories and major hospitals to be able to uh, to to meet the kind of accreditation criteria they need. Uh, so you have to have a medical director, you have to have a registered vascular technician. The registered vascular technician has to meet a certain reproducibility criteria, and all of these are based on the old-fashioned method that they had. But they they and, and worse thing is they came and added to their conclusion that our board does not recommend screening for carotid IMT and uh, we don't say anything about coronary calcium at this time and left a very, uh, uh, I think, unjustified uh, uh, and, and uh, vague. So well, our, our position now is that in the state of Texas we're waiting for another legislative uh, initiative to go back to the bill and try to put an amendment there that a law that would allow the uh, adoption of this test by primary care physician. But the question to this committee, to us, is that how can we do that without sacrificing quality and being made, uh, in, in, in making sure that the doctors do the test uh, properly and get the results properly. The quality calcium part and the lowering radiation and, and these advancements, I think, has made some part of the job done. But the carotid uh, is still a question. And things that we heard yesterday was were promising. We need to see how quickly they come to the doctor's office. So wanted to quickly update you that the, the bill passed, you saw in the news, and it's hard to <coughs> world covered and all this, but the practicality, I mean, the devils are in details, and that doctors are not being reimbursed today. And that challenge is up to us to, to solve. Jim? Well, it's interesting that by you doing it the right way, it's brought in all sorts of attention on quality and certification. Let me tell you what's going on in Colorado and I think in, in probably other places. There are at least 20 to 30 primary care doctors in Denver who are making a huge living on getting reimbursed on carotid IMT. Okay, I mean, I'm talking about some making six figures. It does show, uh, just on that procedure alone, it does also illustrate um, uh, pro one of the problems in the carotid IMT community, which is the average physician truly believes on an individual patient basis that they can do this test every six months and say, look at that Niospan is done, they're doing better. They have very little insight or interest in some of the discussion we've had as far as inner scan variability and those kind of things. They normally have outside services. Who's paying for it? Well, here's what's happening, is that the primary way they're getting billed is actually illegal billing, okay? And if they were discovered, it'd be a $2,500 fine per incident. What they do is either call this a limited carotid ultrasound, okay? They don't say it's CIMT, because that spells deny. That's a T code, uh, an experimental code. So they say limited carotid ultrasound. Now the problem with that is that it's specifically stated that if you use a less specific code than the procedure you're doing, then that's illegal. The second thing they're doing, some physicians are doing, and they're getting paid for this, very right? it's just falling under the radar screen as a limited, uh, limited carotid ultrasound. The second thing they're doing is saying that we're doing a full Doppler <coughs> B-mode ultrasound looking for flow, and they do have a radiologist do the flow studies and then do the CIMT for free in the sense that they're getting paid for the, the Doppler ultrasound. The problem with that is that 
the indications for a Doppler ultrasound looking for flow problems are things like TIA and a few other things. And so by listing stuff like family history and other things, somehow they're getting by, but what they do is they normally fudge up the diagnosis code to get the thing. So he, both of those are fraudulent billing. Yeah, well, we can't we can help that. that no, I'm just saying that they're not getting, none of them are getting uh, a screening. Sc no, uh, getting comments that, hey, listen, who's doing your, what's the quality? Uh, these are com companies that bring in their Sonosite, uh, various uh, other types of technologies. They bring them in and they're getting paid uh, per either per case or per hour to do a whole lot of people. And these doctors have sort of like a vascular day, three days a month, where they might do 20 or 30 of these things. Yeah, frankly, we haven't, got, we haven't gotten uh, calls from practice, practitioners, because most of the practitioners, almost all of them, in, in primary practitioners in Texas don't even know about this law. They have no clue this is available and the screening is available. So there's a huge amount of education that needs to be done. The ones who have contacted us are some diagnostic centers. They say, well, what happened? This bill was going to be uh, you know, reimbursing the screening and, and we have this broad IMT. How can we get reversed? But they don't know that the ICABOL uh, requirement is a very uh, uh, exhaustive procedure that they need to go. But Perhaps there will be some other, and I know that there are a lot of uh, interest in some of these mobile companies because it's, ironically, ICABOL allows a mobile company to get quickly certified, but the primary care doctor offices, you know, you are just a doctor, you need to hire a, a registered vascular technician, you have to show me reproducibility and performance, send me the results, and pay a thousand dollars up front for just registrations and, and get, so we've opened, um, an unwanted, uh, 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 you know, payout for the adoption of this 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 bill that we'd be working on. Yeah, um, none, none of that's going on in Denver. Uh, yeah. It's kind of the wild west in, in doing this. It's actually affected carny calcium facilities because physicians who used to refer for carny calcium realized that they never made money in carny calcium. Now they're making money in their office. They they. Uh, they do a couple of carotids a year on each patient. Yeah. Let's hear from Tasneem. Tasneem, you're again on the uh, ground level dealing with actual training and reimbursement. Uh, the part of the program that we, we put together, the agenda, and we're going to touch it and then take a break and, and come back, continue, and that is, do they really, do you, as an ultrasound IV expert, and I'd like to get Howard's uh, input there. How much training did they need? Did, did they really need a, a you know, two-year training of ultrasound uh, as a registered vascular technician to do a CRUD IMT? Or it can be done much quicker. Uh, I've heard some of the um, pioneers in ultrasound say they really get the right situation with even cardiology fellow, they can train them in two days and be able to do probably the ultrasound. Let's just start with your comment, and then Mr. Carr and Howard can give us some more additional uh, comments. So I actually have prepared a bunch of slides. Yep, do you want to? Yes. But before I start presenting them, um, when I first got into IMT through a, um, one of these multi-center studies, I actually started through Meteor study. 40. And um, I actually went to Ward Riley's lab uh, at, uh, at Wisconsin to, uh, uh, sorry, at um, to uh, Big Forest to train. And when I, uh, you know, heard, listened to the talks and read the papers, I thought that it was easier for me to become the messenger of God than to ever do IMT. It was really portrayed as the most difficult, you know, hardest test ever, and it could only be done in a core lab and, you know, in, in a research setting and so on. So that's what my introduction was. Um, and then over years, I then participated in the Pfizer study, the Procitrapil study, for which I was also a sonographer, which was actually a little bit of an easier protocol than Eric. And then over time, I, I got involved in actually establishing an IMT service at Cedar Sinai, where patients were paying for their services, and we were actually measuring these IMTs. And now, um, I got an opportunity to actually do some research projects which involved training the um, 
the residents and the cardiology fellows. So I have so far trained three, three people. And I will tell you that um, with all the other things that a cardiology fellow does uh, and a resident does in their day-to-day -day life, it took me a month for, for me to feel comfortable that they can do this on their own. So you know, I gave them the education material, um, I gave them introduction, gave them a little talk, and then actually showed uh, them hands-on scanning on, on, on them, you know, who acted as volunteers. Uh, and then I went with them to do the patients for the study. Uh, so I would scan them myself, show them all the different um, you know, nuances and so on, and the pitfalls, the ECG, the, you know, the, the labeling, the depth, the gain, and all those uh, machine-related factors. Uh, and then I would have them scan at the end a couple of views. And then after I had done maybe, I had showed them three scans, I would actually have them scan and take care of the machine settings myself. Um, and then probably would, this would happen for two scans and then on the, 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 the next one they would actually take care of everything but I would be watching them. Uh, so, you know, overall I think if you do this on a regular basis, a month. But if you're not doing patients, you know, at least twice or three times a week, then obviously the training would be that longer. But a cardiology fellow can, I think, be trained in a month. Uh, whether the same applies to a medical student, um, uh, I, I don't know, because their knowledge obviously about, you know, general terms in medicine is a little bit less. But I don't see why they cannot be trained in, you know, a couple of months. But this is, with everything else that goes on, in, you know, as my own responsibilities and as the as a fellow's responsibilities. We're not talking about a dedicated course here. So anyway, um, what I, uh, and so through my involvement here, I was then involved as an advisory board for Sonocyte, which involved myself, Jim Stein, and a couple of other people who actually made, uh, and we had a, you know, I don't know, two-day meeting, and we came up with an abbreviated protocol and believe it or not, that this American Society of Echo Guidelines or the, or the uh, endorsement, uh, the, the consensus statement that came out, I think it's 2008, really is a summary or an abbreviated form of the Pfizer protocol for torsitribil and the two-day symposium that we had with Sonosai. And this is really what is in this document. Uh, I'm not a member of this task force, but I can tell you this is really what, uh, what we have been doing. So uh, I, I just thought that to start this, I would just show you some of the relevant um, training uh, requirements or uh, suggestions that the American Society of Echocardiography and those by Society of Vascular Medicine has come out with. So um, the important thing here is that they, uh, as, as who should be doing them, they are kind of initiating with sonographers only who are registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer, medical sonographer, or a vascular technician. Uh, certification in cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency procedures. And this is the part where I feel that um, you don't necessarily need to have accreditation in ultrasound. Uh, you can actually do this to any student in medicine, and I will kind of elaborate on that as we go along. But this is the minimum training requirements that they have suggested uh, be incorporated in, uh, in training uh, people who want to do the IMT. One is an eight hour of didactic or online training. When you go through the, you know, you know, you are all informed about the topic, but imagine somebody who does not know about subclinical atherosclerosis. So you know, you just you kind of basically educate them with pathophysiology, to pathologic correlation between ultrasound, uh, carotid artery anatomy, cardiovascular risk assessment, rationale for non-invasive testing, uh, and then how could you, you clinically use this ultrasound? Um, and then comes the, uh, the actual scanning technique, instrumentation, the protocol selection, imaging pitfalls, um, and so on. And, and the fact that IMT does not substitute for a, a clinically indicated vascular exam, uh, ultrasound principles, and so on. And then you, you do hands-on supervised training, scanning a minimum of eight hours in person, um, where you emphasize the protocol, the image acquisition, and how to select a good image how to lay the carotid artery horizontal, how to show the, uh, the near and the far wall of intima, and so on, how to identify plaque, what, what is the short axis, what is the long axis, et cetera. Uh, and then the same people should also uh, uh, be uh, allowed an opportunity to actually read these IMTs so you understand the potential pitfalls uh, of, of uh, image interpretation 
um, which is entirely dependent on the quality of image provided to the reader. So two hours of that kind of training. And then after this, they follow it up with, with their own uh, mock studies. And they are suggesting at least three paired mock studies uh, or review by an experienced sonographer uh, where two sets of images should be obtained at least one day apart from three patient models. Um, so you get intersubject variability and so on. Uh, and you want to, so, so the so, uh, scans are sent somewhere, we don't know where, you know, probably to a core lab or to sites which we are going to discuss how to set those up, where you want them to demonstrate protocol adherence, uh, image quality and image reproducibility. And then after they receive this initial training and they are now uh, ready to scan patients, they should perform at least 25 IMT studies annually uh, and then they should be annually retested for repeatability. Um, and if there is an activity for more than two months, they should perform two mock studies to show continued competence. Uh, and so this is, um, you know, adopting the American Society of ECHO recommendations. Uh, I personally feel that instead of restrict, restricting it to the sonographers only, it should really be taught to pe uh, people based on the desire to learn. <coughs> Uh, it could be an MD, it could be an RN, it could be an RVT. Uh, you know, you could even talk about students, MAs, uh, EKG technicians, etc. Um, step one of IMT training, as as, as you saw, eight hours of lectures uh, could also you know in, include an IMT manual, where these students are uh, talk, uh, they learn about the basic physics of ultrasound, atherosclerosis, and IMT. They have review articles in there. They have good multi-center studies, uh, and they are shown examples of IMT images, and this is in a manual and a DVD form. Um, after they have read this manual or have listened to an online lecture series, uh, step two, and this is again something that obviously, you know, we brainstormed a couple of times on our own telephone conference uh, with Shape, but, uh, you know, this is some, uh, one route that could potentially be taken to train people so after they have uh, read this material, they take a test where they need to score at least 80%. The test can be repeated multiple times, but there are free, few critical questions that have to be answered correctly. Uh, and step three is then practical training at one or more designated regional IMT training centers. Uh, and this could in include a, a one-day course, which again, you, fall, you, know, you start with a little theory, just a refresher. And then the students actually go on to the machine uh, now, these are the recommendations, again, of the American Society of ECHO as to what kind of instrumentation should be used. State-of-the-art ultrasound system, which has digital image acquisition and storage capability, preferably in the DICOM format, which all ultrasound systems really now do. There should be phantom scans performed every six months so that you make sure that you have good, um, um, uh, you know, particularly after any system changes because that can affect your precision of scanning and semi-annual routine preventive maintenance, which really all, at least in the institutions, all ultrasound companies, ultrasound machines have a service contract where they undergo preventive maintenance about twice a year. The type of transducer recommended is a minimum of uh, seven megahertz or more, with a footprint of three or more centimeter, minimum compression, when you save these images so you don't lose the data, a linear array transducer, uh, depth, uh, focal zone settings, frame rates, dynamic range, ECG signal being displayed at the bottom, annotate images to describe segments, angles and other findings, and adhere to the protocol. Now the IMT scan itself, uh, you know, you can, uh, as we all heard yesterday, if you just uh, restrict yourself to measuring the IMT of the CCFR wall, you actually can potentially miss uh, atherosclerosis itself which manifests predominantly in the bulb and the internal carotid artery and, um, and, um, and particularly in the form of plaques. So the time it takes to do the IMD protocol really depends on what your underlying, um, what you choose to be your underlying protocol. The ASE recommends that you should uh, look at scan, uh, 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 plaques and that you should image uh, the CCA itself in three longitudes of angle. And I totally, I mean, I personally feel that just imaging the power ball of CCA is not enough to look for subclinical atherosclerosis. Um, so that you start with a transfer scan uh, and you go up the neck so you have a plaque screen here. You do the internal and external carotid artery Doppler to make sure that you distinguish the two. 
I don't particular, I don't personally think this is an absolutely necessary step. Um, and then you do the longitudinal scan where you uh, image in three different angles, again, because we are two-dimensional, so we try to get maximum number of uh, views so that we don't miss a plaque in an anterior, middle, and posterior angles. And then you do the, um, so this is your plaque assessment. Short axis, long axis. Long axis in three planes. Short axis, as you saw, somebody showed the beautiful three-dimensional reconstruction. The problem with, with short axis, it gives you a good map, but it's itself just doing a short axis is not enough to really totally identify the plaque because you can have a very oblique vessel and you may miss it. So you really do need to do the longitudinal. And then from these longitudinal scans in anterior, middle, and posterior angles, you save an optimal image at the beginning of our wave, and that is the frame you choose for IMT assessment, the, the near and the far wall. Um, how would you train the students in actually doing the scan? Um, you demonstrate, you could demonstrate among volunteers and so on. Um, students learn how to apply ECGDs, how to hold the probe, get short axis, how to get long axis, how to differentiate CCA from uh, from wing, ICA from ECA, uh, and this is the basis for doing the Doppler evaluation because the Doppler differs. Uh, understand what anterior, lateral, and posterior angles mean, and more importantly, to understand the machine gain control settings and the machine neurology, which varies from machine to machine. Um, uh, the um, Step three, uh, this is again a combination of ASE, my own experience at this meeting that we had with Sonosai, Students play with the probe and the system. Trainer acquires a complete scan following the, proto following the protocol, and students get their question answered. So first, somebody demonstrates to them how to do it. The student then does the entire exam, uh, and then there is whatever questions they have are answered, and then um, uh, they perform a volunteer scan following the protocol, sit images, still images, whatever pro protocol you need to follow. Um, the, digital, the, the study is then discussed in the group as to the pitfalls and the strengths and the weaknesses of the study. The students are trained on data analysis, images measured at the onset of QRS. And then they go back to their respective sites. They perform first five scans as practicing scans on their own. They send the sixth to the tenth scan to the reading or the training center. And again, this number could vary. They do three scans and send their fourth one and just fourth one only. Interpreter looks for study quality, gain settings, depth, angle, correct collection and analysis, uh, and, so, and then these students are then certified uh, based on a, fee, you know, a form that you can create where you provide them feedback. Um, and you can mark, you know, they have to be absolutely right on a few things. If they are wrong on one or two, that's okay, but um, if they meet those requirements and they get certification, um, maybe they under, need to undergo refresher training once a year. Um, and then as far as who reads the scans, you know, what about their training? This is again something of which is very important part of uh, making sure that your IMTs are done and interpreted correctly. Again, these people, uh, the, according to the ASE, should uh, get a minimum of eight hours of didactic or online training. Um, they, should, they should actually themselves perform scanning, uh, although they will not be doing this routinely, and again, it depends. You can have the sonographer who did the study or the person who did the study, the technician could also be the one who interprets the study, or you could have separate people doing and interpreting. The requirements for the one interpreting as far as practical training is concerned, recommended by ASC or suggested by ASC, I should say, is two hours. They should then read for a minimum of two hours at the training center, and then they should submit at least 10 measure scans to a core laboratory or to any facility which you know, we identify as a suitable facility with published accuracy and reproducibility data. Uh, and then they should read at least 25 CIMT studies yearly. Um, all this could really be incorporated as distant learning, you know, the eight-hour didactic uh, lectures, uh, the, the test, uh, the scoring of the test, the feedback could all really be done on, uh, online. Um, the question is about the practical training, which I really think is has to be hands-on training. Um, uh, and then, obviously, which is the lab who's going to take responsibility for, uh, for training these people and interpreting their images and so on is a big question mark. Um, who's going to then uh, uh, accredit these personnel? Now, currently, the way 
uh, echo labs work and the vascular labs work, the sonographers do not have to personally get accredited. Uh, there is going to be a bill coming up where all the sonographers have to be registered, which means they have to have taken their, their board or their, their exams. Currently, that's not the case, as long as the lab director has a board accreditation. Um, so as long as these personnel are directed by a technical supervisor and a medical supervisor, that alone is enough for these people to work. What, what currently happens is that instead of the personnel, the labs are certified, which obviously is not going to work if you want these IMPs to be done in private physician offices. And the certifying body that we went over uh, are ICAVL, the American College of Radiology, who accredit the labs based on the quality of study that are submitted to them and so on. But who's actually going to be the accrediting body or these personnel who are not in an academic setting or a large lab is something that uh, really that's our challenge. Out. That's thank you. That's exactly what we want to land. And I think we can learn from uh, the PAD coalition and the, the uh, college's uh, experience in working with industry because this definitely has a huge part of the industry who you work with. And you said you had meetings with Sonosite. I think what we would be, I mean, I'm just thinking now that ideally it would be we could come up with some kind of affiliation between SHAPE and what uh, Jeff is doing and the college and, and see if we could combine IMT and, and ABI training because the doctors really need at the bottom line see the financial uh, benefit from having, you know, hiring a new person and going through all these trainings and, and becoming uh, a, a certified body. Let's see if uh, there is any comment on. So this is something that you just put together because that that was new to me. That was right. great. Right. I'm glad that you took the initiative to do that. Let's regard any comments you uh, and and Howard. And no, I think the team summarized this uh, pretty nicely. We, this is done in the Echo Lab at Mayo, and the technician, uh, the two or three that are really good at it, and they do most of these studies. And uh, the technician is not only a cardiac sonographer, but is also RBT trained, has had extensive training, and in turn has uh, trained the other technicians. And we have, you know, inbuilt uh, measures of quality that are uh, uh, in, uh, reinforced. Uh, as far as uh, reimbursement, I know Jim Stein worked quite hard in Wisconsin, and he claims that he's uh, done well with the blues particularly in the setting of family history. And uh, when we use it selectively, we haven't uh, so far got many pushback. So maybe Pierre or Johnny wanted to uh, add some comments? So in, in Michigan, individuals with family history can In get, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. That's for Jim Stein. That's what he's, you know. He, that's good. He has actually met with Medicare and Blue Cross and uh, uh, well, it won't be Medicare, it would be Blue. Yeah. Would be blue. Yeah. Uh, local, local insurance. Uh, and, and has been able to get reimbursement for, uh, so they have set up a pretty good... Oh, that's good. We should, we should look into details of what he does. He spent quite a bit of time mm -hmm. in yeah. meeting yeah. with yeah. these people yeah. and setting this up. Great. Jeff, yeah, that's something that we need to take. <coughs> uh, Howard, you've been there longer than anybody else. Any comment? How can we turn a primary care practitioner to somebody who could do this task? I'm sorry, your question. A primary per, primary per practitioner could do the test or become an IMT center rather than a huge lab and Mayo. Mayo, there are not too many Mayos. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex issue. Uh, and it depends on a lot of different um, perspectives. Some which are philosophical, uh, many which are methodological, and uh, I think as Tazim went over the, her, her slides, it's um, rooted in some history that began some you know, 20 years ago. So when you look at the historical perspective, um, this all started with a very complex methodology created by a non-radiological uh, group of individuals, mainly epidemiologists, who had very little knowledge of the concept of imaging. 
Uh, Atherosclerosis imaging has a, has a long historical basis going back about 30 years. And there's certain fundamental uh, issues in atherosclerosis imaging that, that uh, need to be incorporated within, within uh, imaging the wall if you want reproducible data, re reproducible information. So with that said, then, then there's the view of what do you need to image. And what drives that is whether this is more of an academic pursuit or something of simplicity that you could deploy into clinical practice easily, rapidly, and reproducibly. So, uh, you know, we, we've been involved in this for about 20 years. Uh, we've had uh, many grants uh, looking at the, the problems and issues, how to address them, and how to develop methodologies and technologies to bring reproducibility down. So, uh, listening to Tesla speak about it takes a month to train somebody, we bring people into our lab and we train them within a day. And they're out reproducibly doing image, high image quality, uh, the moment they go back to their lab. So we do, we, we do distant learning when we have problems with, with um, sites. And, you know, we've trained, I don't know, over 120, 150 individuals. And I agree, these don't have to be registered people for doing sonography. And we've trained all levels of individuals. We used to joke when we, when we used to do our non-human primate work that the monkeys could jump up and do it on themselves. So there are very simple techniques, and this could be done very, very reliably. Uh, we just published a paper um, across a large, one of the large national HIV consortiums. Um, I forget how many sites it is, a dozen or so. And the coefficient across, variation across the sites with the methodology that we deployed in that study was less than 1%. Um, so, you know, now the question is, is that something that, you know, one want to deploy into clinical practice or does one want to more uh, sophisticated type of uh, um, survey of the vessels. And these are the things that have to be kind of sorted out. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's complex. I mean, when it comes to, when it comes to clinical practice, um, you know, somebody said it here, you know, the CT part's really easy because that's easily standardizable. So is CIMT. It just depends once you get beyond um, a single segment, you know, um, where you go from there. I, I think you're you absolutely right that, that CT became standardized because it was, you know, two million dollar at that time. It needed it. So much investment and so on. IMT was not like that. Now, if there is reimbursement, if there is acceptance, IMT could have that impact. And in fact, we've come a long way since five years ago, and things that we saw yesterday. That's a good testimony. How about this training that you do for in one day? Your protocol involves one angle of the firewall of CCA, right? So, so not exactly. Um, our core lab, we do we do all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, we deploy from IMT to lesions to vascular stiffness to epigenicity. I mean, we we have the whole gamut of um, adding on, let, let's say that you're at, you know, you, you go in a common carotid and you want to add on a sweep for, for lesions. Um, again, it depends on how rigorous you want to uh, image the other segments. But all time involved uh, in terms of um, patient or subject time on the table is 10 to 15 minutes. 20 minutes max if you're, if you're going to do some other specialized imaging. And then in terms of training, because of the simplicity of the, of the approach, it really isn't all that much more complicated. It's just teaching the individual what to look for. And that's, that's where you were getting at about, you know, showing them images, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
when it comes to when it comes to the uh, imaging of the wall itself for IMT, our philosophical approach derives from that fund of knowledge is generated out of uh, Atherow imaging for the last 30 years, which is if you want reproducible information about change, okay? So we're focused on change because our whole goal was to develop a methodology that could be deployed longitudinally. The, the problem, the problem, I mentioned a little bit of this yesterday, the problem with the major studies that started at NHLBI, like ARIC, and the other large cohorts like CHS is that those methodologies were not really developed for longitudinal imaging. It was always the impression or, or the outset that these were gonna be cross-sectional studies. So longitudinal variability didn't matter. The philosophical approach was much, much different. So this is why it's taken thousands of individuals to see certain relationships with change over time because you need you need these massive numbers to see the signal through the noise. So our focus has been um, to be able to reproducibly image uh, the same segment through the same angle repeatedly. And that's and that's what we developed. And and you know there's been there's been at least 50 different ways investigators have tried to do this around the world. Um, Euro Europeans do it a little differently, um, but they've more adapted to the way we're doing it now. Um, in America, the, out the goal was, because this is the way we did it in angiography, which is how... The immensely prognostic value in the common carotid artery, because it correlates closely the risk factor, there is a greater potential for additional prognostic information in the carotid bifurcation because it doesn't correlate strongly with risk factor. I think it makes sense in some way. The way of thickening actually goes on with blood pressure and blood pressure goes on with age. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when you look at all the, late, the data of intimomedial thickening, you realize it's an age-dependent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least these other studies under the MRI that we do. And, and, and goes with age goes up, and if this blood pressure goes up, further, but it is very questionable what this is adding yeah. to what we see with imaging in the focal disease yeah. and what is adding to the risk factor profile in general. Why would 